Come and join me in my own personal journey of hop-ups and upgrades from the very beginning to what I do now. Hey guys, welcome back to Tammy Legends and once again thank you for stopping by. So, hop-ups and upgrades. It can be a little bit marmite with, with people. Um, I've kind of wanted to make this video for a while but I never really knew what kind of format it would take. So basically what I've done was obviously I have a massive love for hop ups, stroke upgrades. But as this video goes, how I look at these things doesn't actually make any sense and I think a lot of you will agree and probably feel the same way about it. So I'm going to try go through this as, as I say we're going to go right from the beginning to where I am now with it all. Um, so it should be quite interesting and I'm going to give you a lot of background of, of my personal history and, and I think when we take all that into account what's happened up until today it'll kind of make sense or it should make sense um, why I do what I do. So for me there's a distinction between hop up and bling. They can, sometimes they're exactly the same thing, a hop up is bling, sometimes bling is a hop up. But sometimes, for me, something is just an upgrade and not bling. And here's the messed up part in my head, the way I look at it, so certain things. Sometimes a piece of an upgrade, I don't see as an upgrade, I just see it as pure bling. Right, let's get into this. So, all the way back to the beginning. So, I ran around with real beat up Tamiya cars back in the day uh, when I was a kid. And... <laughs> Bling wasn't a thing, 100% bling wasn't a thing. Upgrades, at that time in my RC and hobby career, lifestyle, whatever you call it, um, hop-ups weren't really a thing either. Now, I was trying to, I've really give, I've done some like soul searching and trying to really sort of reminisce and think back to what I was doing. Um, <laughs> for me, an upgrade back then at the beginning would have been a more a better motor and a higher capacity battery NICAD that would have been hop up uh, upgrade the I don't even remember putting bearings in my cars back in the day and and bearings were mega expensive back then as well for some bizarre reason um, sometimes they were like quarter to half the price of car I remember seeing the adverts in like Otley Model Sport for all the various bearing kits but my, my point I'm trying to make is yeah it wasn't a big thing to be honest um obviously you you for me i'm running round on what would you have been running on so obviously for a start 7.2 nicad uh i'm just trying to think of cell capacity probably 1200 packs yeah it'd have been a 1200 7.2 nicad um and motors were 540 silver cans um so as a kid, for me, it was all about it was for two. It was about two things. It was trying to make it faster than it was, but also trying to make the, it the car the runtime last longer. Um, so I mean, with my crappy batteries back then, a five forty silver car probably got ten minutes out of it on a twelve hundred pack. If that, maybe eight minutes. I don't know. But yeah, then you then as I say, I got hold of some different motors, um, Demon. Um, I've talked about the Kyosho Spa, 240WS, um, Palmer Cyclone, things like that. Um, the, the only modified motor was the, the Kyosho Spa, the others were stock. But you you went from a 540 and put a, a stock Demon in with the same battery. And oh my god, this just completely different world of running these cars just opened up, didn't it? And you know, I, I probably look back with rose colour spectacles on but the cars were like lightning you know um and then battery wise you know going i remember what was it how tamia brought out the sc no the extra or no the ex with a gold pack can't remember i think it went up to 1700 milliamps a cell you know all of a sudden i can't remember what that equated to but probably getting an extra three four maybe five minutes run time that's huge that was huge back in the day so that at that stage, right at the beginning, that was kind of where the, the my upgrades were, as it were. And then later down the line, um, the first, as a majority of regulars will know, the first Tamiya kit that I actually built brand new was a Thundershot. Um, 
Now, here's where I've got my memory of my first hop up. Now, I'm probably 14, 15, maybe 13, I can't remember. Um, I'm at roughly that age at that time. And I remember shortly after the um, Thundershock came out, the Tamiya released the dual front shock conversion. And uh, I remember actually going to Watley Model Sport to buy it. Now, the silly thing was, there was actually nothing wrong with the, the CVA monoshock on the Thundershock. I remember when we used to wrap it, rag it around and jumping it off curbs and stuff, the suspension was superb on this car. But um, yeah, it was like you're taking that one single shock and you're going to two. It was like a big thing. And it wasn't an expensive thing. And I'll say I got it from Otley Model Sport. I remember it came in a box and obviously it would have had the Tamiya sort of hop up logo on it. Probably not the one it has today. Um, and it kind it kind of had like an artist, like a, almost a CAD drawing of the car. So it had like the two yellow CVAs coloured in, and then the drawing of the car and how they went together. And you just got the two shocks, and you got something else, and I can't remember. It was probably different screws and things. I can't remember. I should remember. Um, but yeah, that's my first sort of. Oh, yeah, that's my first hop up I ever got. Now moving on slightly. There was no more hop-ups that I can remember. Again, it was just motor upgrade and battery upgrades. That was kind of where I want. So you had the car, you were happy with the car, and it was, it was again, it was about making it quicker and making it last longer. And, and just looking back, you know, I had a bog standard thunder shot. Things like, by the time I'd probably raced, I was, I was racing my thunder shot on local club on a Saturday morning um, in Bradford on a grass, outdoor grass track. And, and just thinking back now, had I been into the hop-ups or had a, an understanding of how to make a car better, you know, the the next, the Terra Scorcher was probably out by then, you know, so I could have bought the um, Terra Scorcher um, front and back camber links, possibly the, was it rear or front? I think it was a front swear bar. No, it was a rear swear bar. Front universal joints. You know, if I had to put them on that car, they would have been genuine um, hop-ups. But again, that just wasn't in my head at that time. Right, so moving on in the timeline now. This probably takes us to probably 98, 99, possibly. Um, and bearing in mind, throughout my timeline, I've, I've been in and out of the hobby. I've not done this constantly. Um, but for some reason, and I can't remember why, I discovered one-tenth touring car indoor carpet racing. And uh, I just, for whatever reason, I've probably, I've probably gone to watch a meeting somewhere. And uh, just by watching it, I was like, yeah, I really want to give that a try. So I ended up buying the Schumacher SST touring car. This was Schumacher's entry-level touring car. It was actually, they did, a, they did a saloon car, like a rally car as well. Um, but this was a touring car. And I absolutely loved it. Now, it was very basic. It wasn't, it was FRP. I'm pretty sure it was FRP. I don't think it was carbon. Could be wrong. Um... But basically, this is where I get into um, hop-ups because, <laughs> and hindsight's a wonderful thing, I basically started with the rock-bottom Schumacher SST and by the time I'd finished with it, I'd spent a fortune on it and it was basically now the SST Pro version. But it cost a lot of money to get it like that. So there was, there was the Pro version had the... And, and this is where the first... Yeah, I think this is where the first sort of anodizing of metal alloy parts came about and I got a real love for that. So Schumacher at the time still are, I believe, yeah, well, they were using the purple anodized alloy. It just looked so gorgeous. So you do the shock upgrades and then there was a big metal alloy motor plate to do. Turnbuckles, drive shots, I can't honestly remember. Whatever I could buy for that SST um, in hop-ups from Schumacher, I put on that car and it was pretty much a pro, if not better at the end of it. But again, that wasn't so much me wanting it to look better. That was in my my head back then, this would make the car better on the racetrack. Then when I was racing touring car, at one of the meetings, it was in uh, Morley. No, it wasn't Morley. Oh my, uh, oh, it's on tip of my cut. Gel something. Oh my goodness. Anyway, it was a indoor sports center. I can't believe I've forgotten the name of it. Anyway, uh, I was racing the Schumacher there, and that's the first time that I'd ever saw the X-Ray T1 
one of the lads just turned up with it and sort of everyone were around him and it just come out. Um, now, the X Ray T1, in my opinion, was an absolute game changer for the touring car scene. It's, it, it, it went basically kind of full alloy. So you had your big alloy front and rear bulkheads. And X Ray at the time, this was when X Ray would, it came out and it was silver. It wasn't the kind of orangey colour that X Rays are kind of well known for. Um, now, I do think that the original T1 came with a plastic chassis. I'm pretty confident of that. And then after that, it was went full carbon. Now, I know they did a T1 Evo, and I think they did a T1R version. Timeline-wise, time -wise, I can't remember. But that picture I'm showing you was the T1, and that was full carbon and all that beautiful alloy everywhere. And just after seeing it, I, I honestly fell in love with that it wasn't falling in love with that particular car it was falling in love with what a high-end touring car looked like and it was just like that's amazing at the same time when i was racing there as i say i used to i, I worked very close to morley back then in leeds morley models models shop i should say uh, morley models and i used to nip up on my lunch but my lunch break probably twice a week uh, and just buying little bits for my sst um and that was tyres and things and motors. But uh, I always remember this. I, I walked in and a lot of you Marley Models people will know who Gary is and his dad. Um, I walked into the shop and Gary was behind the counter and he had this black box. And I was looking at wheels, tyres or something. And he's just pulling these bits out and just having a look. So when I went over to pay and have a little chat with Gary, he was like, he was saying, oh, this is the new Tamiya touring car. Now it turns out that that was the TRF 414. The very first one and it was super rare super expensive if you know the 414 you'll know what i'm talking about and uh i was just having a look in the box with him and it, it was funny i think we were giggling at the time because obviously you don't get you didn't get a shell with it you didn't get tires you didn't even get wheels but you did get these awesome alloy beautiful silver machined setup wheels for it um and it was mega expensive and from memory i think it was it was only one kit per shop um, and I think it was like 500 quid back then so a ridiculous amount of money and I just remember being so jealous and just like thinking is there any way of buying it but obviously there wasn't I remember Gary saying at the time because obviously it kind of just come out and even Gary at the time was he was he was debating whether he was going to build that kit for himself and race it himself instead of just selling it on the shop you know but um, yeah that if you know the 414 that was Tamiya's first proper touring car that i call it obviously we did earlier trfs on the ta chassis and stuff but that one was just like that was the beginning full carbon and um alloy front and back bulkheads and just just gorgeous looking thing but could never afford anything like that so i still had my sst anyway time goes by and i get hold of a hpi i need to get this right a hpi rs4 pro touring car and that was the that was the best touring car I'd ever had up till then. It was full carbon. It had the beautiful anodized, like a ready purple aluminium on it. It was it was top spec and um, and it was a great car at the time. Um, and I did I, I did some racing with that, but not a great deal. But that's round about the time where I started to just over appreciate the just how good these high end touring cars look. Um, I just and to this day I just adore them. They're just they're just special, you know. And I, I don't know why they just they just look superb to me. Um, and around about that time, I think I started. I, I probably had a, my, one of my IKEA cabinets, maybe or something, or some kind of display. And I had a few touring cars. And I think I went for a little period of time. I think I started sort of collecting touring cars just to display, no shells on them or anything. So I actually went out and I bought the Team Durango, and I can't I'll forget the name. It was the touring car. It was the four ten. I think the picture I'm showing you is the v version two of it. And I don't. I can't remember if I had a V two or not. Can't remember. Um, and this thing was the first thing I'd built and put together and this was really high end and quite expensive but Durango had gone for this like goldy orange like an orangey gold alloy obviously full carbon and uh, yeah I built that up and what a thing that was to look at but funny enough I did try to race that and I didn't have any luck with it because my driving wasn't the best so anytime I clipped um, the guttering or whatever you call it around the indoor tracks 
I broke something on it and uh, I just remember the front end for me personally it was very weak so that car actually got the electrics taken out of it very quickly and went into the, like a display cabinet so then the next one I bought was the Hobeo and I think it's called the HS4 I remember this coming out um, Otley Model Sport I went over and bought it straight away and do you know why I bought it? because it had green alloy on it and I'd never seen anything like that um, Hobeo you know, they weren't known for touring cars. I think back then, they were doing what I knew one for, were one eighth nitro cars. Um, back then, the one eighth electric cars weren't a thing. It was too soon for them. But um, yeah, and I just remember going over, I think I paid about 270 quid for it. And I walked out, because I just thought it was cheap for what it was. Um, anyway, price-wise, I remember they go for silly money now. And they, I remember all the model sport, they, I think it was like 270. And I think, a year later, they still had some kits, but they were up at like 400. It was, it was very strange. Anyway, bought that, built that one myself, and it was incredible. Just, again, total full high-end touring car, carbon everywhere, that green alloy everywhere, and it just looked superb. One of my biggest regrets is I never actually ran that car, and I could have done, because that was around about the time I was, I was off and on going to Doncaster Touring Car Club, and um, for some, for, I don't even know why. I was right in the midst of alcoholism then, so that's probably why. But I have a big regret that I remember buying a full setup station for it as well, and it was mega expensive. And I, I really didn't have it that long. It was probably on display for like five, six months, and then I sold it on, which is a regret. But while I had these other cars all on display, that's when I bought my first sort of modern day TRF, and it was a TRF 416. And I only bought that to go in the cabinet. And, but I'll tell you what it is, I'll never forget the day I, I pulled that out. It was a brand new build I bought, and I, it was grisly cheap. And I just remember bringing it out of the box and, and just how light it was in my hand. And I've just got this, because obviously I'm, Tammy is always number one for me. And I'd never I'd never run a Tammy touring car. And I just had this 416, and you know how, how gorgeous it is. Just, again, total high-end carbon everywhere. And then the Tammy blue alloy everywhere. And it was just like, put the wheels on it, tore up the slicks on, the dish wheels, and st stuck it straight in the cabinet. Just a gorgeous looking thing. And then from memory, the last sort of, just while we're talking about that little collection, I got hold of a Tamiya TB Evo, the first one. It came in a really cool square box. Mega, mega cool. It wasn't particularly blingy or high end, but it was the highest end TBO one they did. Um, so it was full carbon, so um, main chassis, top deck, towers, it had these lovely aluminium silver shocks on, uh, full bearing kit with it and what have you. Um, it was really high end for what it was, but I remember getting one of those in the collection as well and um, that was just a real pretty thing to look at. So with all that said, I think that's where my love for the bling side of it came from, from the touring cars, because although you wouldn't look at them and go, yeah, that's a blingy thing because it's just high end and it's just everything's on it that should be on it to make it go as fast as it can. I kind of started to look at them as just pure bling, just pure eye candy. And then moving forward in the timeline again and, and getting into the first, I've had to rack my brain now to, to figure this out and I got some pictures of it. I was trying to work out what's, you you guys and girls will notice is like now when you're wanting to put a load of hop ups and upgrades on a car, it is such a buzz, isn't it? Well, back in, and I, I'm not too sure of the year, 2013-14 maybe, I got hold of a Kyosho Laser ZX, sorry, the Kyosho ZX-5 Laser. Um, it was like a ready-to-run kit. One of the best Kyosho buggies of all time, in my opinion. It ran great, and it looked superb. But that, that body shell and wing just floated my boat. Anyway, I got a pretty beat up one, and for whatever reason, I decided to go full hop up on it. And it was it was metal hop ups as well, so it was anodized blue, and uh, and I just bought every bit they did for it. Obviously, these were aftermarket Kyosho parts. I bought every bit and I fitted it, um, and I even got rid of the um, laser body shell and wing, and I put I think that was a bulldog body set. I think bulldog rings a bell for some reason, so it was a real cab forward. I sprayed it in this ridiculous pink colour, bought some Kyosho decals. I think it had, from memory, FTX Vantage wheels and tyres on it. Um, but I remember finishing that, and and this is where the joy came into it for me of 
taking something and just adding all these bits to it which supposedly made that made that car better so it costs a fortune and at the end of it i don't know really what you've got but i just remember even all the way through to just putting a new body shell and wing on it you know that was completely new ground for me and i think that's where my love for changing bits it wasn't so much bling but you know just for that chasing chasing parts and then getting them all and then starting that project where you've got a perfectly good car but you just take bits off and add these bits on and at the end of it you're just looking for me personally i just look at in in awe of it and it's like yes look what i've created do you know what i mean and i know some of you out there know exactly what i'm talking about it's 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 a special part of a hobby we all know that like the ebay chase for parts or wherever you get your parts from you've been waiting for something for ages or you're bidding on something it's a real big part of the hobby but equally for me when you're just changing bits over it is absolute class right so bringing this forward to kind of today and where i'm at i've kind of broke down what i do personally into three categories again at the end of this i don't think it's going to make too much sense because my categories overlap which is a little bit bizarre but Category one is buying something completely done high-end. So I brought up two examples. First one being, again, because of my love for touring car. So this is my um, TRF 415. <laughs> just said 414, that's what I've said. That. This is my TRF 415 MSXX. And this is a 2007 model and it's a Mark Reinhardt edition. But it's, it's complete eye candy. It's obviously full carbon, blue alloy everywhere, and I mean everywhere on this car. It's just, there's nothing like it. There really isn't. And I can't tell you how much I enjoy looking at something like this. I don't have any drive whatsoever to put electrics in this and run it. I really don't. I just, that's, for me, that's not, obviously it's a 2007 car. That's not, I would never run this now. I thought I was when I built it brand new, but uh, I never would. It's just, you just hold it and it just oozes quality. And again, if this is a category on its own, this isn't upgrades, this isn't bling. This is a, just a finished high-end car. But when I look at it, I just see eye candy. I just see bling. Um, the second car I brought up was is basically the same. This is the TRF 503, uh, new built by me. Again, just so obviously, it, it, the, these two cars were the pinnacle at the time of launch of what Tamiya were doing. This was 2014 and still is the last four wheel drive TRF buggy they, they did. But again, just absolute eye candy. A lot of people say that the Tamiya TRF four wheel drive buggies were basically just the touring cars with longer arms on and bigger shock mounts. I don't know if that's true because the layouts are different, but I can see where people are are going with that but again you know front and back alloy bulkheads this huge bulk um bulkhead in the middle full carbon now the 503 is actually not full carbon it should the standard 503 has a metal chassis but i actually bought the fiber light um carbon main deck for it main chassis just to say it was all carbon because this is just a showpiece for me um but again with these two cars it was just that's that's category one for me that's you don't do anything you just buy these high-end car um, but again pure bling so moving on to category two or my category two I should say these are not bling these are just hop-ups which in my head is these are just pure upgrades and nothing else although on some of the cars very blingy but I don't see it like that at all so I just thought I just brought three examples up so our first one being the um, Tamiya Terra Scorcher. Now, this particular car is pretty standard and it's quite sort of, it's got the sort of the best of bits on with it being a Terra Scorcher anyway, as opposed to a Thundershot. But in this car, upgrade, TTO2 prop shaft, hot shot cups. It's got a, the big alloy A5 part on it. Um, obviously it's got high cap shocks on it. And um, the, let's get this right and the front and rear arms where it goes on with that screw they've been replaced and it's had got hinge pins all around so they're genuine hop-ups and what a genuine hop-up to me means is 
I don't I don't look at it as bling. That makes that car so much better, so much stronger. That car will just go better. Um, example two, I've brought up my DB01 Durga. Now, a lot of money in hop-ups have been spent on this car, but to look at it, you wouldn't think so. It looks, apart from the shocks, it looks quite standard. But, so a standard kit we had, as soon as I, I built it standard and then I made the replacements, first things to go was um, I took the plastic front and back shock towers off, fitted it with carbon shock towers, then fitted the aeration shocks, which is a bit of a must, I think. Um, slipper clutch went straight into it. It's got the full um, alloy blocks front and back, which just gives it tremendous more extra strength. Um, it's got front universal drive shafts in it, and the front and back, top and bottom shock mounts are alloy. Shout out to Lee if you're watching. Um, which completely eradicates the play out of those shocks. It makes, out of, when you put upgrades on, sometimes you don't really notice it's an upgrade. When I fitted them, I was like, it took that slop straight out of it. It was amazing. So, yeah, a lot of money spent on this particular chassis. But, again, you to look at it, you wouldn't think so. But genuine upgrades. Now, here's a car in the same category, but it looks incredibly blingy, and that's my, you're probably sick of seeing this thing, this is my TTO2B, um, and actually, this, although you're seeing this video way later, this thing's just come back from an indoor track day, and it performs superbly. Now, the whole point of this car for me was every piece I added, every upgrade I added to it was to make the car better, but you look at it, and it looks incredibly blingy, because there's a lot of blue alloy. Now, in my head, I don't see that as a blingy car. That's got nothing to do with it. All those bits that are fitted on this car make this car go better, and I proved that point of the track. Um, so just quickly, from a standard TTO2B, uh, we, we took the plastic shock towers off, FRP shock towers, a DFO3 shocks. There's got the alloy steering set, alloy prop shaft and cups. It's got um, alloy U UJs front and back, full bearing kit. Oh, God, alum aluminium motor mount. Um, yeah, it's just, it looks blingy, but it's it's actually not in my head. So that's category two. Then we move on to category three, which is a real odd one. I know this is an odd one. 100% I know this is an odd one. But this is such a fun part of it. So category three is basically getting rid of the word upgrade and you're just fitting bling for no other reason than you want the car to look good. I don't care if it runs better. I've brought two examples up and I've got a third example of one which will really not make sense. First example I've brought up is my um, TCO1. Um, I ran this, built this car new, I ran it standard, loved it, had a touring car shell on it, not the Formula E. But when I'd finished, I'd done with it, and I'd finished a beautiful Formula Formula E shell, um, I had to buy this bling for it. I had to, and it's not cheap. So we've got the TRF shocks. I had to buy the TRF shock retainers, TRF shock extensions, the um, alloy pivots, and again, obviously, that's front and back. Um, the wheels help it look because of the same colour, so it makes it look blingy. But, um, yeah... The only purpose, I don't care how those parts work. That's pretty ridiculous, isn't it? I honestly don't care how those parts work. They just have to look like that. Because it, for me personally, it takes that chassis to the next level. And even though I don't see those bits when the shell's on, I know they're there. That's weird, isn't it? When you, say, when you just say that out loud, that makes no sense whatsoever. So the good thing is, I'm aware that it makes no sense, but it doesn't stop me. Second example is the new um, TD4 Super Avanta. Now, I did this in stages, but basically this kit out of the box could do with a few hop-ups straight away. Um, the, what is it? I think there's two and there's a possible third. First one, ideally, you want to put, oops, you want to put um, front universal drive shafts in there um, so you can have full steering and you don't have to worry about the dog bones popping out. Um, second one is the alloy diff locking nut front and back. 
Um, people have got away with using the plastic ones, but um, I just changed them to that, that one straight away. And the third one is the servo mount alloy um, mount, but I've heard, I've seen YouTube channels who have fitted them and the steering hasn't imp improved dramatically. But, um, you know, two or three kind of upgrades that really the kit needed from me off. But everything else on this car that I fitted is complete pointless and it's just all about bling and eye candy. It's as, it's as bad as this one. It makes no sense. Now, again, shout out to Keith. I was given these parts. I probably wouldn't have done this off my own back as it were but um, given the opportunity to do it and this is now I think apart from titanium screws this has got every TD4 hop up available so obviously at the time I fitted the aeration shocks uh, it came with a blue um, prop shaft but all the turnbuckles are now TRF blue it's got the um, blue front and back sway bars it's got the pivots it's got the full alloy steering it's got the block at the back um, it's probably other stuff. It's got a slipper clutching now as well. Um, it's got that pivot arm there. Um, yeah, that is exact to me now. That's exactly as a TCO one. I don't. <laughs> I'm going to say it again, and it makes no sense. I don't care if those bits make that car go better. If you can get better lap times, or it's more enjoyable to run with those. I don't care. I just. It just has to look like that, which is crazy, isn't it? Um, but I bet a lot of people watching this fully, are, are, you, you're probably with me, you get it. And here's the third car that I've chose to show you, which is in category three, which is basically just bling, but it shouldn't be in that category. And this is my broken thinking with it that I was trying to explain earlier. So straight off the bat, this is my top spec, top force that I built. Um, it's absolutely stunning. Um, and there's a lot more I could do to it if I had the Tamiya tokens to do it. But what's funny about this thing, this this was, I built this before the um, re, re Evo came out. Um, and this was built from a standard top force. So full cab and everything, shout out to Nick. Um, full sort of alloy everything, shout out to Bora if you're watching for those amazing alloy parts you make. Um, so yeah, I put this together and I wanted a full spec top force. And as I say, there is other bits I could put on it. It's not finished. Well, it is finished for me, but if I had money, I could go further with it. But again, so we made it full carbon, um, big boy aeration shocks, all the blue turnbuckles everywhere, um, alloy motor mount. We've got the alloy prop shaft and cups. We've got the wheel speed alloy steering system in there. And then the rest of the blue that's scattered all around it are Bora's amazing bits. Um, even, I've even got blue um, ball ends and nuts on this car where I can. It's just crazy. And that big front alloy brace on it. Now, this is the messed up thing. This is this is the weird way I think of this car. I can honestly say hand on heart, this is a full spec car. Every part on this car is to make this car go better. 100% there is not an ounce, an ounce of bling on this car which is just to look good. Everything on this car makes this car stronger and a lot more durable. I, I know that. However, I don't I do I can't look at that car this car like this. This car to me is just I can it. This is just bling. And this is where in my weird mind, this is where bling the bling distorts, bling and upgrades distorts. You know, I should just be saying, yeah, it's fully upgraded, looks great, but I don't care about the upgrades. I don't care if this car is pretty much as strong as it can be. It's it's bling and it was made and I spent the money to make it look like eye candy, which is weird, isn't it? I hope I'm making sense in what I'm trying to say. Um, it's just a very strange way of doing things. And that's, that's kind of my three categories. So I've got, just to recap, what is it? Because it's confusing for me. So you, you've got your high-end kits, which are all done for you, which you don't usually change unless you're racing them. Um, and they're, they're just, although you could say it's got every upgrade, it's got all the bling pieces, but again, it's just a high-end bugger. Category two is all the hop-ups, genuine upgrades that you don't I don't look at as bling they just make that car better. And in category three, where 
it's basically what's that saying we're polishing turds uh, some people would say that with what i've done about the ttr2b but you know it's like spending all that cash on those extra blingy bits just to make it look good and it, as, as you all know these parts are not cheap i dread to think how much this thing cost me to put together um i don't know it is seriously hundreds and hundreds of pounds i think this is around about seven eight hundred quid that it cost me to put together anyway you know what i'm saying is it doesn't make any sense to do it but it does to me and i know it does to a lot of you girls and guys and girls it's just it's such a journey I don't know. This has probably been a way long video and it's probably not making too much sense because I've kind of made it in one sitting. I've not wrote anything down. I'm just kind of saying what I think. But yeah, I think I've kind of explained where my love for Hop Ups and Bling started. And obviously it was definitely the 110 touring car and how that's um, followed me all the way along to today where, you know, I've now got these imaginarily three categories that I do with my collection you know it's it's funny and to be honest I've got no plans I think I've got to the stage now of category three where you're just blinging stuff up massively I'm really calming down on that because you, I don't need every car done like that and it's just way too expensive although I do have uh, of the time of making this video I still have my DBO2 Leonis to build and that's just about got every Tamiya genuine hop up to go on it and it's a crazy it's a bag full of blue bits so that's going to be pretty epic um but after that one's done i'm pretty much doing stuff standard again um i've kind of been there done that you know i'll give you an example of td2 uh as i'm making this video now the td2 is just landing in the uk and stuff you know i thought i was going to do what i did with the td4 you know fancy big wing on it do something different with the shit the liveries and stuff shocks and any blue bits but i'm kind of thinking against that now i think i'll just build a standard td2 and that's probably just down to cost i guess i don't know i don't know it, it, it's interesting why some cars have to do it and some cars i'm like yeah i don't need to do that anyway i'll uh i'll shut up i have no idea i've got i think this video is going to sound very mixed up so if it does i apologize and if it didn't make any sense to you, I apologise. But um, if you're still watching, it must have been entertaining enough. So I will end this video here. As always, my friends, thanks so much for watching my rubbish. It's massively appreciated. If you are new to this channel and you're still watching, wow. Maybe give this video a thumbs up. If you do that and you're not subscribed, go subscribe. And if you do those two things, go hit that notification bell buzzer for my weekly videos. That'd be absolutely outstanding and massively appreciated. <sighs> And as always, my friends, happy RC. Mm -hmm.